My name is Dean Conrad. I'm a medical scientist and medical journalist. I was an Army medic in World War II and did some microbiology in the Army. Later, I received a Ph.D. in pharmacology from Vanderbilt University Medical School. I had clinical pharmacology training, that is, understanding the mechanism of drugs in humans, and I retired as Senior Director of Clinical Research here in Stanford. I received a Master's of Public Health at age 62 from New York Medical College because I was wondering what I was do do when I retired. I was also a medical journalist. I was an Internet columnist at medical meetings, publisher of two handbooks on selection of home health care, assisted living, and nursing home providers in Fairfield County, Connecticut, where I live. As an educator, I taught at Wake Forest University Medical School and New York Medical College. I was a community volunteer for the city of Stanford, particularly in the Department of in the Health Department. I was a research advisor, member of the Health Commission, and interim health director. I was on the board of directors of our city nursing home. My life with Riva before dementia, it was stable in spite of my career changes and professional travel. One daughter, Cammy, was born while I was in graduate school, and the other Gwen, the other Gwen later. Riva supported me literally without complaint while I was in graduate school. She was always she has always been good natured and in good humor. How did I adapt to Reva's dementia? Well, put it frankly, the first year of diagnosis was very difficult for me as a type A personality. Reading about the disease and listening to others at caregiver support meetings helped me accept reality and adjust. Now, in my opinion, I'm a patient, understanding, type B, both daughters adapted well to Reva's dementia, and it's a pleasure to be her caregiver. Dr. Conrad, if I could interrupt just a moment, I would like to remind the participants, um, if you press star, mute yourself, part of the teleseminar, we'd appreciate it, and then uh, during the question and answer period, you can log back in by pressing star seven. Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Conrad, but it sounds like you and your wife had a wonderful life together. Um, how, long, how long ago was she diagnosed with dementia? She was diagnosed uh, roughly seven years ago. I first noticed that she was acting odd when she refused to drive the car that I had bought her. So that kind of raised a red flag. And things got worse, and finally... I was able to get her diagnosed, and she was diagnosed as probable Alzheimer's disease, and the medication schedule was uh, drawn up at that time. And shortly thereafter, I enrolled her in a daycare, and she goes to daycare four days a week. So the the initial diagnosis was just a small change in her her attitude and regular activity? Well, that's what I observed, but mm-hmm. it got worse. Her memory uh, got worse, and also she was unable to do a number of, of uh, things like keep, uh, keep the uh, checkbook accounting, uh, plan meals, cook. It just got worse until uh, I finally was able to persuade her to be diagnosed. Mm-hmm. But it's it, it's really a hard job to get somebody to go in for a diagnosis, and it certainly turned out that way with, with Reva. I made appointments several times, and each time she canceled them, and so finally I persuaded her to have the diagnosis. And since that time, things have been pretty good for us. She is uh, probably in the second, the middle stage, of Alzheimer's disease, but no patient is the same as another. She fluctuates mm-hmm. between early di- early Alzheimer's to mid-Alzheimer's. 
And it, it's uh, as I get into the caregiving uh, description of her, uh, I think you will appreciate what I'm saying. How did you elaborate on how you convinced her to finally uh, go to the appointment for the diagnosis? Um, that might be helpful to people listening. Well, a lot of it is luck and persistence. In order to be a good caregiver, you have to hang in there. If you think something is is wrong, you have to take care of it. So, it, as I mentioned, it took over a year to get her to get diagnosed. Hello? Yes, I'm on. Okay. Um, while we're paused, uh, again, I'd just like to remind the participants, um, if you could uh, mute yourself by pushing star six while uh, Dr. Conrad is talking about his experiences, uh, we'd appreciate it. And then uh, during the question and answer period, uh, if you'll push star seven, that will allow you to come back into the room and ask your questions. Thank you. Um, Dr. Conrad, if I could ask you, how did you come to the decision to care for your wife yourself at home? Well, uh, it, it's a combination of uh, people who are capable versus people who are trying to become capable. Mm -hmm. It turns out that during my post-retirement years, I audited a number of courses at our local university. One of the courses was gerontology. And my project was to get three people together and review what was going on in our city in terms of adult daycare. And so I went to two that we had at that time and was really impressed by the socialization and the variety of activities that were furnished by the adult daycare. And one in particular, Waveney, which is in New Canaan, about 15 minutes away from Stanford where we live, impressed me more than the other one. The other one was run by the city, but Waveney had excellent, still has excellent staff who stimulate my wife, Reva, and that's one of the important things that is lacking if somebody has an aide come in for the day or however. Mm -hmm. They just don't have the experience nor the training. Whereas in adult daycare, if it's well organized, it really shines. I happen to have the schedule for the month. It came in the mail today. And... I want you to ask yourself, how many CNAs, Certified Nursing Assistants, could mm -hmm. do the following? Play music. Lead a word game. Play balloon tennis. Name the state. I can go on and on. Reva goes to daycare at... 9.30 in the morning, comes back around 4 o'clock. She goes happy, comes back happy. I am so glad that I did that project for the course because it opened my eyes. Really. Yeah, sounds like it. Um, can I ask you, are there other resources that you found, um, either you know through social services or or other organizations that offered support? Well, I deal mainly with the Alzheimer's Association and the New York chapter, Alzheimer's Association chapter in Connecticut, and the chapter in New York City. They have a <laughs> helpline, and there are loads and loads of activities for caregivers, from training to seminars to publications, and the best source of information for caregiving is with the National Institute on Aging, part of NIH. If one goes to their website, there's a plethora of sources of information that a caregiver can check 
and apply. What I want to mention about caregiving in terms of my experience is it just made me a better person. My first year was very difficult as a type A person. I wanted everything to go smoothly. Well, it did not. (laughs) Yelling and screaming at my wife made things worse. I had to change. How did I change? Slowly I learned to lower my voice, take on a friendly tone, observe body language, and recall the likes and habits of Riva. She likes music and singing, so I joined in. Riva prides herself on spelling, so we read the good old days together. Riva likes to dry dishes, so for the first time since marriage, I wash the dishes. Together we walk, do chair exercises, go to movies, attend church services, and laugh a lot. Giving up my wide range of community interests wasn't easy. I still go to weekly meetings of the Stanford, Connecticut Senior Men's Association, enjoy lunch with my college chum, John, attend local concerts, and learn from a social worker by attending her co-ed caregiver support group. My hobby of cooking keeps Riva and me healthy. But let's not talk about the other chores, such as house cleaning. (laughs) Well, it almost sounds like dementia has brought you and your wife closer and been a plus in your life. That's really interesting to hear. (laughs) Rick, you put the hammer on the nail. That's correct. That's correct. And it's harder for children to take care of parents who have Alzheimer's because they don't have the history of the parents. Whereas it's important to look at the history of the person that you're taking care of. Your wife likes and hobbies, all of that. It all comes into play in caregiving. It can't be divorced from caregiving. The person remains the same. It's the disease that makes the behavior different. Uh huh. Personality is the same, but the behavior is due to the loss of neurons. That's a really, really good point to hear. Thank you. You're um, welcome. Now that you're, you've talked a little bit about the support group that you attend, um, can you tell us? Um, how you were inspired to start the the men's caregiver group? Well, this is what happened. I went to at least four co-ed caregiver support groups. And as you might guess, men were in the minority. It was predominantly women. And generally, the social worker was a woman. And let's face it, women, by virtue of being a woman, require more airtime. And by requiring more airtime, that left little time for the men. In addition, men don't speak the same in front of women. For example, how many men do you think would talk about sex in a co-ed support group? Also, how many women would talk about sex in a co-ed support group? So that convinced me that really, I being in the minority and not enjoying the support group, thought it would be desirable for me to start a support group. Well, that was easily said. It took a little time to figure out how to do it. (laughs) So I took I took a couple of courses with the Connecticut chapter, one being a general orientation for caregivers, uh, and then the other was a one-hour hurry-up training session for what they call facilitators of support groups. So with that training, that was in 2010, 
of 2009, I said, well, I, I better do a lot of research on my own. So I went to the Internet and got some books and learned on my own what it takes to be a caregiver. And if you understand what it takes to be a caregiver, you certainly will understand what it takes to lead a support group. Because as a caregiver, I have much in common with the members of the support group. Let me mention a couple of books that I think are very, very helpful for men who are caregiving for a wife who has Alzheimer's. By all means, get the Male Caregiver's Guidebook, edited by Judy Lawson. Another good book is A 36-Hour Day by Nancy Mace and Peter Rabins. Lastly, this is the freebie, Coach Broyles Playbook for Alzheimer's Caregivers by Frank Broyle. These three books help me appreciate how hard it is for men to care for an AD wife. And it's even harder for a man to admit that he's a caregiver and needs help. Well, how did I get prepared to form such a group? I, as I mentioned, I took the two courses, and recently took uh, last year I took the course at New York City chapter. In January 2010, I announced the formation of such a group at the Stanford Senior Men's Association. Two members responded from my short talk, and I recruited a third male that I had befriended at a co-ed group. Last year, I completed the four-day training program for support group leaders at New York City Chapter. And from that, I learned that their approach is more psychotherapeutic, and Rick, you would appreciate this, whereas the approach from the Connecticut Chapter is more educational. So from these two training sessions, I came to the conclusion that I would feel more comfortable applying both to my support group. So last summer, by virtue of publicity from the local newspaper and a local physician and a social worker referring, we reached 13 members. The 13 members made a one-hour meeting very difficult for everybody to speak. I have a personal feeling that if you attend the meeting, you count the number of people who are attending, and you divide the time by that number, and that's the amount of time you have to speak. So I divided the 13 into two groups. And we meet twice a month on alternate Tuesdays. So I'm leading a group every Tuesday of the month. The Meetings that are held have a short educational part of it. Today I led a meeting, and we had an update on what was going on in terms of caregiving and dementia. The following 50 minutes are devoted to the group talking amongst themselves. That's when I'm the listener. And today's topic was the finances of taking care of somebody who has dementia. So the various members of the group, some are widowers, spoke about what it cost them. And surprisingly, we live in a Gold Coast section of Connecticut, and it costs roughly $150,000 for nursing home care. And for assisted living care, it's roughly $100,000. So it's a major concern of caregivers how to plan for the costly, for the cost that's involved in having a loved one in a nursing home. That was the subject of our conversation. Now, it behooves everybody who's caring for another person to think of the long-term care, and the cost of long-term care. One cannot divorce themselves from that 
obligation. That's the message I want to leave with everybody. That's, yeah, that's very good advice, um, especially if there's any like uh, younger people listening who may be in a position to purchase long-term care insurance at this point. It's, it's always a good idea to prepare for that. Um, now, in forming these groups, um, did you have trouble... I mean, can you tell us about how you found places to host the groups and, and what that entailed, the process of that? Well, uh, I had contacted numerous people, and the, the publicity that evolved was not really that helpful. The members that have joined have joined by word of mouth or by referral from social workers or from physicians or from my speaking at the senior men's association meeting. The the uh, publicity that I received in the local newspaper, it was a good story written by their ace columnist. It brought in a couple of members. So it's really the word of mouth and getting the medical profession and social workers to know what you're doing. And once they have confidence in you, then they'll start referring their patients to you because they can't manage them. That's mm -hmm. usually what happens. Either a psychiatrist can't manage the patient or a social worker can't manage it. So they say, okay, Gene Conrad's available and there's no charge, so let's send them there. And that's what happens. How about it's, not the, easy. it's not easy are, to, to recruit men to join support groups, whether they're cancer support groups or Parkinson's disease support groups or dementia. It's very hard because, in essence, it's a blow against our ego. We feel we can solve everything. In fact, the other day I, I received an email from a leader of a men's support group who also is a caregiver and he mentioned that in Delray Beach, Florida the men that he talks to feel they know everything they're not ready to listen the person who comes to a support group is really at wit's end they've had it and they need some help so that's it's like a helpline in practice what about the actual physical facility? How did you go about locating a place to actually meet? Well, the physical f facility was given to me very graciously by our pastor of the church. We meet in the library of the church, uh, rent-free, because we don't charge anything for for the support group, and they're confidential and no cost at all. So he does not, the church does not charge us anything. It does charge commercial groups that want to meet at the church property. Mm -hmm. He is my number one supporter. Now, I must, must mention that at least once a month, he adds our support groups to his prayer list. He's very, very dedicated and he has facilitated my appearing on local uh, television and also on local Internet communication systems. So he has been very, very helpful. And he's negotiating now w with a son who's taking care of his parent. And uh, I must confess, I don't have any experience in that regard, but as I mentioned before, it is very, very difficult for children to take care of dementia parents. Very, it's more difficult than a spouse. Mm -hmm. Because of the relation that, relationship that they have with the parent as opposed That's to... That's right. It's a relationship and not knowing the history. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the support group that I lead, the two support groups that I lead now, they, they're very, very compatible 
and our attendance is about 75%. And we have one member that doesn't have a computer, so I don't send reminder a reminder to him. So I called him today, and this is just an example of what uh, what causes absenteeism in a support group. He had to take his wife to see the doctor, and we we see that quite often. And uh, th- there's no way to control. You don't. I don't believe anybody gets 100% attendance. It's just too hard because th- things happen, just like the thing that happened to me this afternoon on the sundowning. It just, you know, this, it, it, a person who's a caregiver has to dance on a dime. They have to be ready to do something t- that will take care of the situation. For example, my wife became argumentative, and I tried to reason with her. It didn't work. So then I found out that she wanted to have an apple. And once I gave her the apple, the argument went away. But it's difficult to read somebody else's mind, whether they're normal or abnormal. And so it, it, it's a hard job. What are some of the other topics that you have brought for your uh, informational sessions or sections of your, of your caregiver support group? Well, during the three years that I've been doing this, I developed 25 one-page handouts. And the topics are all over the place. Uh, new drugs, we talk about new drugs, what's coming down the pike. And some of the men have their wives participating in the studies. And they actually range from uh, stove top cooking to nutrition. And it all is related to what I do at each meeting. I hand out three by five cards and ask the men to write down because sometimes they don't want to voice the topic that they're interested in. Write it on a three by five card, then I collect them, and then I sit down and go through them. And those that I think are beneficial, I will do research on them and prepare the one page handout. But they they really like that. And having done that and having the journalistic background. <laughs> I came to the conclusion that perhaps I should put these together and write a book. So that's what I, I'm doing now. And what the what the members of the group ask about is is related to what they're going through at the present time. And that is helpful that I respond to their their inkling of what's going on. Our support group meetings when it comes to updates by the participants, I ask an open-ended question, which is, what's going on in your life? Not in, not specifically in your wife's life, but in your life. How are you taking care of yourself? What are you doing? Remember the recent survey that was done? Caregivers thought that the number one person to care for is the person who has dementia. That's not the first person to care for. The first person to care for is the caregiver, because if the caregiver is not functioning, what could we expect from the person who's sick? So we spend a lot of time on asking and listening to what the men are doing in their own lives. It is very unusual to hear a man admit that he cries. And that is something that is psychotherapeutic to the individual and helpful to the others who are listening. That it's okay. It's okay to be human. It sounds like a wonderful way to engage everybody in the process so that they they feel like they're part of the group rather than just being lectured at or anything. So that, exactly. That's... There are too many support groups that consist of listeners. Mm-hmm. We need more participants who will share their feelings and how are things going in their own life. I, I get a lot of pleasure out of seeing men who come in really befuddled and within several months, sure 
more positive approach to caregiving. Uh, most of caregiving is negative. I think there are nine negative feelings for caregivers and only four positive feelings. So the task that I have is to hope and try to get the men to drop the negatives and adopt a positive. And this is my challenge too as a caregiver is to make sure mm-hmm. that I keep in mind what I what I'm talking about and not just, you know, forget about what I've read and and learned and become part of it. I also belong to a co-ed caregivers group which is run by a social worker and uh it's it's a combined group of Parkinson patients who also develop dementia and uh Alzheimer's. What I learn there, I also share what's happening in my own life because I don't share much to the group. I share it in my own support group. But I also learn from from her. She is the number one social worker in our city. I learn and then apply what I've learned to my own groups, and it's been very helpful. Yeah, what a wonderful way to evolve the the group and and keep it current. Um, Just like to say, Jean, um, or Dr. Conrad, that um, the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation has just uh, created four recipe cards um, that we would be more than happy to make available to your group if you'd like those. I would. We will make sure that you get those. I would Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, you mentioned your book. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that's going? And, and Yes, I can. In a word, it's going slow. <laughs> <laughs> As books do. <laughs> when I wrote the other, the other two handbooks, I didn't have to spend as much time as a caregiver and leading groups. So <laughs> I kind of I kind of squeeze in the time. And I should tell you that I write at five o'clock in the morning while Reva's sleeping. She gets up at 8. So in writing, it's a test of what I know. And in nonfiction writing, it has to be accurate. In fiction writing, it doesn't have to be that accurate unless you have a purist who checks everything that you've, you've written. So this is the general outline. Of course, we want to talk about dementia, the loss of of uh, recent memory and the difficulty in planning and executing, which is also known the executive part of our ability. The, the second, the uh, as we go down the list, as I mentioned, I also talk about the number one problem of caregiving, and that is stress. I spent, I think it was three or four weeks just trying to distill what is known about stress. A caregiver becomes depressed because of stress. And as we all know, depression leads to suicide. So it's very important for a caregiver to try to avoid stress. And the best way to avoid stress is by meditation and I practice that every morning for about 15 minutes before I start writing or doing anything. What it does, it quiets the mind. And the mind and body are so related that if you quiet the mind, then the body is quiet and you're at peace with yourself. So I go into that quite a bit. And then another chapter that I have is on on the... Uh, the economics of caring for somebody in a nursing home, and then the legal aspects that are involved when you're a caregiver. I must mention that it's important for a caregiver to have a team, and the team should be a neurologist or a psychiatrist, 
an internist, an attorney, an elder attorney, to look into the various legal aspects of caregiving, and also somebody to look at your finances. So in order to be a successful caregiver, one needs to have a team. And if possible, it would be desirable to have a social worker also as a member of the team. So these are some of the things I go into. I don't want to give too much away because then then nobody will read the book. <laughs> it sounds fascinating and, <laughs> and very valuable, very valuable information. Um, you have talked about um, the Savvy Caregiving article. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Some time ago, I had a request to boil down what I know about being a cat a caregiver. So I coined the title Savvy Caregiving. And let me read this for you. Success depends on learning about Alzheimer's disease and adapting to the needs of your loved one. It is especially difficult for men. My experience as a caregiver and leading a men's support group led me to prepare a roadmap to deal with this often frustrating job. Become a patient, good listener. Realize change in behavior represents the illness, not the person. Focus more on body language. Recall the personality and preferences of the person before illness. Plan ahead and expect the need to adapt to change. Avoid burnout by taking care of yourself. Make personal time using daycare and other help. Keep social contacts and continue your hobbies. By all means, practice good humor. Remember, caregiving is noble and rewarding. End of quote. Oh, that's wonderful. That, that's wonderful advice. Is there is there some way to access that for the listeners? Well, it depends on what you have in mind as follow-up of this tele-seminar. Okay. If you have it, if if you have it on the internet, I give you permission to put it as an addendum to the teleseminar. Thank you, thank you. You're that, it, that's really wonderful. Um, is there are there any other points that you would like to talk about, Dr. Conrad? And yes, I'd like to talk about my family. Uh, Cami was trained in in taking care of disabled children, and now she takes care of disabled adults. She is my number one back backup at home. In fact, right now she's she's giving Riva a shower and a shampoo. She comes down approximately. Uh, well, she lives approximately one hour away, so she comes down for three hours once a week on Wednesday, which gives me respite. My Our other daughter, Gwen, lives nearby, works full-time, but telephones every day and visits on Sunday for several hours to give me respite. She is our fashionista, so she and Cami keep Riva in good clothes. I'm lucky. Yes, it sounds like it. They sound like wonderful daughters. They're, they're, they're. I appreciate having them. They're fine. Okay. They're fine, and they're wonderful. Well, it sounds like you're. You still have an amazing family, even given your wife's condition, and that's that's quite a blessing. And well, she's done so much for me. She put me through graduate school, and. 
brought into the world two daughters and has taken care of me for, what, 63 years. How's that? <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. That's real good. That's pretty good, right. <laughs> Not perfect, but pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> we can only hope for that, huh? <laughs> I have but, a couple of questions here that I would like to present. All right. What do you do if a wife always wants to sleep? Well, my response is consult a physician so that the physician can prescribe an antidepressant drug, but at home, make sure that you keep your wife who has dementia active. Don't allow inactivity. That's my suggestion. Another question that came in, and this is something close to home, an argumentative wife. You're not going to win the argument. So back off physically and mentally. Meditate. Step out of the room. Meditate. Come back. You will find that the argument was fleeting. The third question that came to me was incontinence. For a guy to handle a female that has incontinence is not a blessing. It's important to prevent incontinence. How do you do that? Well, bathroom calls every two or three hours, and at 3 or 4 a.m., disturb the sleep, bring your wife to the water closet, but Make sure that you have pull-ups available. They're normally called depends. But you don't call them diapers. They're pull-ups. Have, a, have surgical gloves and a pail of soapy water available. Believe me. I've experienced most these three. I've experienced these three, and I'm giving you personal advice. <laughs> Again, wonderful advice. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, at this point, let's go ahead and open it up for uh, any questions that anyone has. Again, um, if you press star 7, uh, you can go ahead and answer your question. And then after you've asked your question, press star 6 to mute yourself again uh, for the answer. So any questions out there? Well, the points you just brought up, uh, one of the things I I wondered about is what kind of activities do you and your wife engage in to keep her physically active, and, and is she resistant to that, or is it um, fairly easy to get her to participate with you? No, Riva is very athletic. Uh, I'm a former marathoner, so the athleticism has prevailed. This is the way we get the muscles moving. We do some walking, but as her disease gets worse, she starts shuffling. That's another sign that the disease is getting worse. But we walk, and then we do chair exercises. There are wonderful DVDs on chair exercises. And then we do, well, the chair exercises also include weightlifting. Uh, she lifts a three-pound weight in each arm, I lift a five-pound. We do it together. And this is important in caregiving, is do as much as possible together with the individual you're taking care of. The other activities that we have, I mentioned reading, and then, of course, she loves music. So we have music going on all day, and we do a little dancing, and, and the music is really the top interest of hers. That's a top hobby. Uh, she had that hobby since uh, high school, and it's just 
She knows the words of all the songs. And For example, one night I'm fast asleep and she breaks out into song. <laughs> I'm wondering, what a nice dream, isn't it, to have a song, to be singing in a dream. Oh, wow. Anyway, we do a lot of things together, and uh, just enjoy it, enjoy it. And I, I, uh, I'm blessed by having somebody as compatible as Riva, and it's been a joy taking care of her, and also seeing myself become a better person. And that is remarkable, yeah. But the any ex- other, are there any questions? Anyone who's listening, um, please just. That bothers Sorry. me. That bothers me if there's no question. There are no questions. Yes, I have a question. This oh, is- <laughs> just a, a short question. I was wondering. It's a little off topic, uh, but you have mentioned um, that it it's very co- um, difficult for children to take care of their parents because they don't know the history of the person. Right. Do you have any advice? Um, Although I realize this is, you know, it's not the focus of the conversation, but do you have any advice for for children, you know, of of people? Well, we're, we're talking about adult children, of course, taking care. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. I come from a large family. Uh, there are five children, and then I have relatives that have children, et cetera. So if somebody is blessed, by having either a brother, not a brother, an uncle or an aunt, that they could ask the question, how was mom when she was a teenager, a young 20? But I understand that is difficult because some children do not have an aunt or an uncle or a cousin that knew that person before they became ill. It's very difficult. That's why I came to the conclusion it's hard for an adult child to be a caregiver. Very hard. In the co-ed group that I attend now, we have three or four, we have four of the six who are children, who are caregivers, and to hear the difficulties that they have, it's just amazing. It's, it's easier to be a spousal caregiver than an adult child caregiver. QED. Wow, yes. Do you have a situation like that? Um, I have in the past, and um, and I know many people that are, most of the people that I know are adult children of, um, adult children caregivers, and uh, it is hard, it is hard, and even on these calls we've had, you know, people that have participated because um, their parents, you know, their mom or their dad had dementia. Right. And so, um, yes, that's that's why. But I think that's that's a great idea. I've never I've never thought of it myself, and I never heard anybody say um, to try to know the person as it was before. You know, before they got ill, or maybe they got frail and elderly. And what what are the things that? What, that's what you're saying, right? To learn the things that they enjoy to right. doing. So you can relate to them at a different level. Exactly, exactly. The co-ed group that I attend has one person whose both parents have dementia, and she is beside herself oh. because of the parental-child relationship. We're children the rest of our lives as far as the parents are concerned. And she tries everything. And sisters don't help. Her sisters don't help. This is another thing. If you have 
a family of several children, invariably one child will take the mantle. The other children just sit by. They deny it. Denial is a very, very prevalent concern of many caregivers. When mm. things are in denial, they won't accept it. Oh, that's not that's a, that's nothing, you know that sort of stuff. It's it's too bad, but it's important that we all care for the caregiver. When we meet a caregiver, we generally talk about the patient. But why not talk about the caregiver? Yes. Because the caregiver is the one that's doing the job. Anyway, you know where I come from. That's very, very wise. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Any other questions? Um, Dr. Conrad, if we could go back to the nutrition again. Um, did you, Have you discovered um, dietary needs that your wife has that seem to help, or do you just cook foods that you know she enjoys, or how do you handle that side of it? Well, the diet is very important. Mm-hmm. Some years ago, I led a walking group, and... The focus was on diet. So since I like cooking, I make sure that we have our fish once a week. I make sure that she has her uh, oil. I make sure that she has her vitamins. Uh, I should tell you that she takes about six or seven drugs every day, including the multivitamin pill. We try to have five to seven fruits and vegetables a day, five to seven fruits and vegetables. She loves fruits, no problem with fruits. So we have, for example, in our kitchen now, we have red grapes, green grapes. We have oranges, we have apples. So she loves to have fruits. And I've known that for many, many years. So we have several fruits and bananas and so Banana is her favorite fruit. Apple is her second. So she has her five fruits right there. We don't have to add any vegetables, but we also have our vegetables. We generally have fresh vegetables. For example, yesterday I made a puree of of uh, eggplant and carrot. I didn't I didn't feel that we should have warm, heated carrot or eggplant, so I made a puree. She just loved it. She looked at it. She said, oh, no. But once she had it, loved it. No problem in terms of of, of food at all. No problem at all. Now, she is not towards the end of the disease. She's probably in the middle. And she has the good periods where you think she's normal. So she's, she's, first of all, I want to say that every Alzheim patient, just as every caregiver, is different. They're not the same. You can't take a bushel basket and put, say, this this person fits here. No, no, you can't do that. So I don't have any difficulty cooking. We have meat once a week. I mentioned the fish. And we have loads of vegetables. Generally, they're frozen vegetables or fresh vegetables. We don't use any canned vegetables at all. We have to buy canned beans, but that's an exception. Most of the time is frozen or fresh. And I think I'm doing pretty well. I enjoy the cooking, and uh, we go out once a week, have somebody else's, like Chinese cooking, even though I did some Chinese cooking in my college days, but not anymore. (laughs) And she just likes it. She likes to have a hamburger periodically, but we don't eat much meat. So it sounds like a little bit like you do go back to the things that you n- know about her history as far as food, too, that, that she'll that's, enjoy. That's very important. It's very important to blend in a regimen with the likes and former hobbies of, of patients. No doubt about it. That's the way to go. And the other thing is uh, the in doing any of the activities, 
it's important to realize that the only activities you do that you have the patient do are those that you feel excuse me that you feel the patient would be successful in. You don't select an action or some activity that you feel is too challenging. Stepwise is the way to go, not once and for all. Mm-hmm. So some of these things, I guess I've done from the reading, I've learned from the reading, and then applied them unconsciously. And that's important for a caregiver to keep up with reading and with the Internet. There's no no end to all the material that you can read. And the three books that I mentioned are good whether you're a beginning caregiver or a mellowed caregiver like myself. <laughs> well, are now there I'm any gonna, other? I'm going to have a drink of water. Of course. Um, are there any other questions? I have a question that was posed some months ago at a caregiver meeting that we had. Uh, the fellow said that he had he had his wife in a nursing home, and the question that went across his mind was, "Is it okay to have females as social friends, not as you know as partners in crime, but social friends?" And the current thinking of social workers is that it's okay to do that because one thing that a male caregiver lacks is contact with women in terms of sociability. And so the advice the group said to him, it's okay, don't let it bother you. Do what you feel should be done. And the the same thing applies to taking care of somebody who has dementia. As long as the person doesn't hurt themselves or hurt others, it's okay. It's okay. So if you do that, I think you kind of modulate the stress and you as a caregiver feel better. So this, this, this was a lively discussion that we had. And uh, that's why I use a quotation like that in a piece that I wrote for for the Internet. But I welcome more questions or discussion. I'd like to get your comments. If you don't have a question, let's hear your comments. What do you think of what I said? Do you think it's a lot of malarkey? Or do you think it's it's practical? What do you think? You're on telephone. I think it's incredibly helpful myself. It's helpful. I think it's very helpful, yes. And are you a caregiver? I have been in the past. You have been in the past. Could could you add something that I may have left out? I I can't really add anything. Um, but of course, my experience was not with um, with a spouse, um, and I'm not a male caregiver. Um, so my perspective is a little bit different. But I can I, I honestly cannot leave anything out. Uh, I mean, cannot add anything. I think everything has been very very interesting. Could you tell us something about the caregiving that you were doing in the past? Uh, well, I have always been a caregiver in one way or another since I remember. As since I remember, um, I was I'm the oldest of uh, all the, my siblings, and I was a caregiver to my siblings when I was five. Um, I was in charge of my the little ones, uh, and growing up, I was the caregiver for my grand grandfather uh, when he was old and not well. Um, I mean, I wasn't the only one, but I was definitely part of the caregiving team um, as a teenager and in my early 20s. 
So, so yeah. um, I've been a caregiver for a loved one who was very ill um, in in the past. Um, so that that's my personal experience. Well, I am very impressed by what you have done. But you mentioned something that is quite common. Why is it that some families turn to the eldest person to be the caregiver and not distribute it amongst the other children? Yes, I know. I don't know. I wish I knew. I think partially, you know, you when a child starts to be more independent, um, then that's when you start giving him or her more responsibilities. I see. Um, and, of course, you know, if you're the first child, you are the, the first one to become more independent. That That's kind of a, it goes, you know, in the flow. Sure. And so, um, but that's a good question. Um, it, it tends to stay a habit, you know, then when, when the children are grown-ups, uh, still, the oldest one has still, in a way, more more responsibilities. <laughs> Do you think perhaps the parents expect the firstborn to do more? Yes, I think so. That's the way it was in our family. The first was expected to do more, and I, being the youngest of four boys, nothing was expected of me. So I had free reign of being myself. Yes. But having Reva, my wife, ill, now has changed me terrifically. And it's helpful, in my view, that we as humans experience this. What do you think? I think uh, f- for myself, I can say that um, I think it's a beautiful experience. Uh, when I when I was a caregiver for my grandfather, he was he was the world to me. As he was always the most one of the uh, probably the most present person in my life growing up. And so it was like a, a completion of a cycle, if you will. That when he, I was you know, in my 20s, and he was older and and dying, that I could be there for him. So I think there is a hidden, um, so-called the hidden benefit in in caregiving because it's it's the cycle of life. I mean, when we are born, if we're lucky, you know, mo- most of us are lucky. Many of us are not lucky, but um, when you're lucky, you have parents and grandparents that care for you and then you get you give you get to give back. So in a way it's a very natural cycle. That was very well said. Maybe <laughs> I'll quote that in my book. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to. <laughs> will, will, will you give me a release? <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thank you. That was great. I enjoyed your comments. Thank you. I appreciate it. Dr. Conrad, I'm afraid that we have run out of time, but I want to thank you for some remarkable insights and advice and and just extremely valuable information, and thank you very much for all you're doing for the caregiving community. Rick, I want to thank the Foundation for inviting me to do this because I'm exhilarated now, and would you believe it? I'm going out for a beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll raise a glass to you, too. <laughs> Take care, everybody. You, Have too. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.